Um, yes, yeah, so I'm studying interactions between light and matter on the nanoscale, um, specifically looking at how radiative rate fluctuates uh, in plasmonic contexts. Uh, so this is a purely <laughs> fluorescence microscopy that I'm working on. Um, and so interactions between light and matter uh, on the single emitter level are very fundamental to a lot of different technologies that we use, uh, whether it's light emission or absorption or some other process. Uh, so if you think about really optimizing these technologies, the best way to do that, I think, is going from the ground up and starting at the very fundamental single emitter limit. <clears throat> and so uh, one just illustration of this is thinking about a simple uh, three-level system uh, to model an emitter. You have uh, singlet state transitions where you'll emit light, um, and then that's more favorable for things like LEDs or anything really where you're working with light emission. Um, whereas if you transfer to a triplet state, uh, it's a longer lived state where you're more vulnerable to photo bleaching and then you have no more emission from that molecule. So if we want to really optimize uh, these types of interactions and if we can control the probability of different states that are transferred to, uh, then we can really have a new level of control in these systems. Um, and so one way to control these is using metal nanoparticles and plasmons. Um, so briefly, just localized surface plasmons are a result of the size, shape, and material of uh, metal nanoparticles, uh, basically, which can confine light and energy to the nanoscale below the diffraction limit of visible light. Um, <clears throat> and so depending on, again, the size and shape and material of your nanoparticle, you can tune the resonant frequency that the electrons on the metal will oscillate at. Um, and that's what's known as your localized surface plasmon resonance. And so this is just spectra for increasing nanoparticle sizes. And so this is very nice for developing new technologies because you can really tune it to whatever type of function you want it to do. Um, so the problem then here comes with studying this because I'm studying light emission. And so I'm working with specifically fluorescence microscopy. Um, and so I run into a problem with the diffraction limit. Um, because like I said, these particles are on the scale of you know, 50 to 100 nanometers in size for having resonances in the visible range. Um, and so then, basically, due to the diffraction limit where your observed light is going to be a point spread function that's around half the wavelength um, of your light or, or of your emission. So if you were to observe any two enhanced emission events around this nanoparticle at the same time, they would be indistinguishable. You wouldn't really be able to tell where the locations are, how many molecules are emitting, or distinguish their enhancement whatsoever. Um, so we need new techniques, and these are known as super-resolution microscopy. Um, and so super-resolution, this isn't uh, AFM or anything like that. But with fluorescence microscopy, this is just anything where you're getting below the diffraction limit of visible light. Um, and working with localization-based super-resolution microscopy, um, we can achieve resolutions down to around 5 nanometers, so it's significantly better than the diffraction limit. Um, and so the premise behind this is that we, if you can isolate single emitters and image them separately, then you can observe a point spread function from the emitter. And if you know, in fact, that it is just a single emitter, then you can fit a function to that and then localize it based on mathematically the center of the fit. Um, and then based on the number of photons you get, you can increase the precision of your fit. And so this is how we're able to basically use this type of microscopy. And so the specific version that I'm working on or working with is called Direct Stochastic Optical Reconstruction Microscopy, or D-STORM. Basic premise behind this is that you are localizing and separating your single emitters by photo switching. Um, so you basically start with a densely labeled sample. Um, so if you were to image these all at once, it would just be one big blur. You wouldn't be able to really distinguish anything. And so by switching these all into a reversible off state, um, and then you can activate a subset of your molecules with an activation beam, usually in the UV region. Um, and then depending on the intensity and duration of your activation pulse, you change the fraction of emitters that you reactivate. And then you can image these, switches them off, and then reactivate a different subset. And in theory, you can just repeat this process until you've imaged all of the emitters in your region of interest. And so then, basically, if you have some interesting features in here, you can observe how the intensity changes uh, depending on your super localized position. Um, so this is just an illustration. Uh, this is for an array of nanoparticles, uh, which you may or may not be able to see on this screen. 
Um, but basically, each of these bright flashing spots is a single molecule emitting. Um, and so we take uh, just a wide field of view uh, video of our sample with emission occurring every now and then. And by observing over time, we can basically collect every emission event. We look at every frame individually and determine where the single molecules are. And then we fit them and super localize them. And so then we store all of these positions away with their associated intensity. Um, and then over time, then we can plot. Uh, this is all of these. There's an array of nanoparticles here. So this is all of the emission events that are collapsed into a nanoparticle unit cell. And so you see that there is more emission occurring in between the tips of these nanotriangles. And that's due to this uh, enhancement due to the electric fields of the plasmon and the increased local density of states. Um, and so this is just a demonstration of how the super resolution microscopy works for looking at intensity fluctuations. However, I want to look at how radiative rate changes, uh, which is a more complex issue, but it's also more directly tied to the enhanced electric field. So it can help us learn more directly about these systems. Um, so in order to look at fluorescence lifetime and radiative rate, I'm using time correlated single photon counting and uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging. So the basic premise behind this uh, is it's a scanning confocal microscopy technique. Um, and you get your fluorescence lifetimes based on a pulsed laser, <clears throat> which will send out a sync pulse, which lets you know where your start time is or your excitation time. And then when you receive a photon in your photodiode, uh, then you know that there has been emission. And then based on the delay between excitation and emission, you get a fluorescence lifetime. And so then you can collect a number of these delay times over time and then histogram them. And from that, you get a decay curve. And this can tell you, based on fitting this with an exponential, you can determine the fluorescence lifetime of your sample. And so by synchronizing this with this scanning piezo stage, you can then look at the fluorescence lifetime at each pixel in a 2D grid, and then assemble basically an image of the fluorescence lifetime and how that fluctuates depending on whatever your sample is. Um, and so this is a diffraction limited technique. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, so in order to basically push this below the diffraction limit, I'm working on combining this with D-Storm. Um, and so the main difficulty with this is that D-Storm is typically a wide field uh, technique. And that's how you're able to observe so many events happening over some period of time. And it's easy because you can, you can just observe anything that happens uh, over time. However, when you're doing a confocal scanning setup like fl uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging, you run into a problem where if you are, basically you need all of your molecules that you're imaging to stay on for the duration of the period of time that you're scanning over them. Um, and so the problem that we run into with high scanning speeds, small pixel sizes, or high excitation intensity um, is that your molecule will turn off while you're imaging part of it and you won't get an incomplete point spread function. Um, and an incomplete point spread function cannot be fit and you can't get proper localizations because it's really important to know exactly, precisely, uh, with certainty where uh, the emission happened. Um, and so in order to basically make this work, we just need to optimize scanning speed, pixel size, everything, um, so that we are getting nice single molecule images uh, with the confocal scanning setup. And so once we've done this, um, basically this is our setup for combining D-Storm and uh, FLIM. Uh, so basically, we start by doing a scan with these parameters optimized so that we get a good single molecule image. And then from our scan, we have all of this uh, uh, photon arrival time data from the FLIM setup. And so we know the absolute arrival time of every, every photon in the detector. We know the delay time of each photon arrival from the most recent laser pulse. So that's where we get our lifetimes. And we know the position of the scanner. Um, so from the position of the scanner and the photon arrival times, we can reconstruct an intensity image, um, basically how many photons arrived in the detector during each pixel. And then we can use this intensity image to do the fitting, localize each molecule. So everything that looks like a good single molecule point spread function, uh, we fit and localize. Um, and then our next step is then correlating this with the fluorescence lifetime image that we've collected. And so then we can take basically a Gaussian average using the intensity Gaussians that we have. Um, so we can take a Gaussian average of the fluorescence lifetimes in each of the pixels that makes up uh, each molecule. And from that, we can basically get our super localization map of fluorescence lifetimes. 
Um, so this is just Sci-5 die drop cast on a blank cover slip, so there should be no real trend here, but this is just a demonstration. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, but our next step is going to be doing this in these plasmonic contexts. Um, so basically I showed you this image earlier of how the intensity is affected um, around these nanoparticles. And so now the next step is going to be doing uh, what I just showed you, except in an array of nanoparticles. So then each of these points will have fluorescence lifetime information. Um, and so this is really interesting because then we can also simulate the total transition rate that's expected around these nanoparticles based on the electric fields, um, just from Maxwell's equations that you would expect at an LSPR. Um, and so by comparing the total transition rate with our experimental radiative rate, then we can determine how the interplay between non-radiative and radiative rates uh, changes at different positions with respect to these nanoparticles, which would be really important for different technologies if you really want to optimize your radiative rate. Um, then you can determine how you should position your nanoparticles to really get you know, the most bang for your buck, essentially, as we're implementing a lot of different technologies um, and trying to improve them as efficiently as we can. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, acknowledge my advisor, Esther Wirtz, and thank you. Any questions? I have a naive question. Uh, when you try to determine the rate, you use a molecule, right? Mm -hmm. Would the molecule move around, or they stay at the same time? Uh, the molecules are, in this case, bound to the cover slip uh, using a silination and then binding the molecule to uh, amine. And so it should be mostly stationary, um, but also, I mean, at the scan times, it ends up being scanning over an entire molecule. It's probably, I mean, it's on the order of seconds. So it's definitely would be moving if I wasn't immobilizing them. That's been a struggle in order to get single molecule images in a focal setup. Any other one? If not, let's sing. Thank you. Thank you.